Okay, so thanks everyone for coming to my talk. I'm going to compare semantic and keyword search for a particular use case as context for, for GPT. Uh, first, I'm Tudor. I'm CTO at Zeta. We're a pretty small startup. We see ourselves as a serverless data platform around PostgreSQL, which means that we, uh, we offer Postgres as a service, but also a bunch of things on top of it and around it, like free text search, vector search, rich types. We have branches, an admin UI SDK, these this sort of things. You should check it out. Uh, in, in this talk, uh, I'm uh, focusing on this particular use case about providing uh, like a AI question and answer uh, bot uh, on your data, which can be, you know, like in, in my case is like a, our own documentation, but it can be your website, e-commerce store, what have you. And let me show you how that works. So these are the Zeta, is the Zeta documentation. We have normal search here, and then we have this ask our chatbot thing. Uh, you might have seen this uh, uh, around. Uh, it's becoming a little bit more popular with various open source tools and such. Have a chatbot that uses ChatGPT to answer questions from the from the user. Um, and you see, we provide a few a few sample questions here. Let's say I pick this one, and then it streams back the response based on the documentation that we have. In this case, it did quite well. How do you get a record by RED? Uh, and it shows me the code in, uh, in TypeScript, because our main SDK is in TypeScript. And I can even switch here to show how the REST API works. And you see at the bottom here, it shows me the pages that it summarized or that it used to collect this answer. So in this case, uh, it found the querying records page, uh, which contains exactly the answer that I was looking for. Uh, and I can do stuff like, you know, I can add, how do you get a record by ID, but this time in Python, maybe? And this one will probably do fine. It's always a little bit with demos of ChatGPT, it's always a little bit risky because there's a little bit of randomness. Uh, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Uh, this looks fine. <laughs> this looks fine. It's, a, it's a using our Python SDK, and it found it, found it here. Uh, but then I can try something that's more like a, a little bit of a three questions. How do I do it in Golang, for example? And we don't have a Golang SDK, right? So it's, this answer is not directly in the docs. So let's see what it does. Sometimes it does good, sometimes not. So in this case, it does actually say uh, I'm sorry, but the provided context doesn't have that information. However, I can use something like the standard library with the REST API that to document. And actually, this, this is good. This is uh, useful. It's not, it's not uh, ready to be used. You cannot copy paste because you need to change this, uh, this string here. But it managed to kind of, from our REST API documentation, it managed to infer how would you use that in, in Go, even if we don't actually have that in our docs directly. And if I'm you know, feeling courageous, I can say, do it in Rust now. Uh, and in this case, it just says it doesn't know how to do it. Uh, so that's fine. And then I can also ask other things like, how do I store an array of strings? In Zeta, we have a special type for array of strings. It's called multiple. And it found that correctly in the docs. It found the, uh, uh, let's see, the data model page. And in the data model, it talks about the multiple page. It found that and, and delivered the result correctly. Now, again, I'm going to try like a three question. How do I do an, uh, uh, store an array of numbers? We don't support that in Zeta. So let's see what it does. Um, uh, again, I'm not sure. Sometimes it's, it's, it's good, sometimes it's, uh, it does like this. So it tries to use, it says you can use the multiple type with numbers. That's not true. It's, it, it hallucinates, right? Now, if, you, if I do a small variation and say floats, now it might actually find the vector type, because we have a vector type which is kind of like an array of floats, so, so that would work. Uh, let's see. Um, it's coming. 
anyway, uh, what uh, what what I wanted to show is it's these chatbots on your own documentation are kind of on the verge of being useful, but you still have to expect kind of hallucinations from time to time, especially if the information that the user is asking, it's simply not there in the documentation, right? Uh, but with the, you know, like with the progress that we get, with the bigger context and so on, we, we, we might get for this vector search use case chatbots on your documentation to be extremely useful so that you can imagine it, it saves a lot of work from the open source developers having to answer questions in, if there's a chatbot that does that. Uh, so how does this work? Um, there was actually, I think, at least another talk that, uh, that discussed this process. You get a question from the user, and then you run a search in the documentation. And the search can actually be keyword search or semantic search. Uh, you get some pages of results, uh, like the actual documents, and you combine that in a prompt, a uh, pretty long prompt. And this prompt, you send it as a question to the OpenAI ChatGPT API, and then you just uh, stream the response to the client. So at the high level, it's pretty simple, but as usual, the devil is in the details. Uh, the prompt that we're building uh, ourselves looks something like this. It's a template, and it says, with these rules, and then there's a list of rules, and this text, and then there's the context, which is the result that we get from search. And given the above text, answer the question. And then we just put the question from the user there, and we let OpenAI ChatGPT do its magic and, and, and see what it does. Some example rules, you can, you can do pretty much anything. These are in plain English. You can give your bot a name if you want. You can give it a personality, stuff like that. Sometimes it works better or not. Uh, format, you can ask for, to format in Markdown when there's code in the response. Uh, all sorts of things. Uh, what I would recommend is to include something like that, uh, like the last bullet point there, which is, says that if the answer is not in the provided context, then it's better to not answer it. And you need to make it really clear for the model to, it's important, do not answer it, uh, so that you, it, you, reduces, you re reduce the chances of hallucinations. That helps a bit, but not, not perfectly. Um, and then the context. How do you find the context, the right pages to fit to, fit to, to the model? And that's a search problem, right? You need, to, you need to do a search based on the question, which are the pages of documentation that are most likely to contain the answer, right? And the bigger the context that the model accepts, uh, the more data you can feed it in. So the, you know, like even if, you're not, if your search relevance is not perfect, uh, you might still get the answer because you just have, you can pass a lot of data to it, right? Um, and uh, ourselves, we use the open AI models, and I did like a, you know, like a small comparison here to get uh, an idea of the context size and the prices, uh, because there's quite a big, of, big price difference between them. So the GPT 3.5 Turbo, which is, let's say, our default right now, you get the context or, of uh, 4K tokens, which is, means about 3,000 words or about six pages of text. Uh, and it's cheap. It's, it comes down to like one cent per question, which is good, like in our case, anyone can ask questions, like it's a, it's a public website, including people that would, you know, like they want to denial of service us and so on, but at one cent a question, it doesn't really matter, it's, it's, it's super cheap. Uh, then I think this last week, there's a new model, GPT 3.5 Turbo 16K, which has four times the context, uh, which I'm pretty excited about. And uh, it's, so it's four times the context and only twice as expensive per token, but it's per token, which means that the final cost per questions come down to five times as much, about five cents. That means, you know, 20, 20 questions per dollar. It's still okay, but depends. You have to be careful. Then, and then there's GPT-4, which has, um, AK context and GPT-4 42K, which is the biggest one and the, you know, like the best one, but it's expensive. It comes down to $2 per question, which of course, in some use cases makes sense. 
for us it doesn't really make sense because two dollars for someone that anything anyone can ask and so on and for most open source projects I guess that wouldn't you know like it would be just too expensive I guess um, right and then there's the search step and uh, as I was saying there are uh, you can do keyword search the classic or vector search or semantic search which is you know like if you are here for the for the talk before it was it was about that and it's definitely very popular right now. Um, so how do you do exactly the keyword search algorithm? Because uh, I mean, you get a question, but you cannot put that question in the search engine. It's uh, because it's formatted like a question and might have context that's not relevant. Uh, what we do is first we transform it in, in, in keywords. And for that, we use ChatGPT itself. And we send a query like this. Uh, we, we say, extract keywords from this query, essentially. We just ask it to do it, and it comes back with three, four keywords for a query that then we can use for search. And then we just do the search. We take the top three results. It's pretty arbitrary, but that's what we do. Uh, and then we use the highlights, because the, the, res the resulting pages might be longer than what we can put as context. So we look where the highlights are, you know, from the search highlights, and select the, you know, like a few paragraphs at the top, or more like a page at the top or a page at the bottom. Uh, and we provide all this context uh, we, we, we send to ChatGPT. Uh, with vector search, uh, it takes a little bit more preparation because you need to split your docs into paragraphs. Uh, at least this is what OpenAI recommends to do it at the paragraph level. I didn't try any other you know, size, but you can create embeddings at paragraph levels, put them in, the, in, the, in a vector database, and then do cosine similarity or, or, or something like that. Uh, and then uh, you take the top results, like you do the embedding for the question, you do similarity search, uh, you take the top results until the context is filled, uh, and that's what you pass to, to uh, to, to chat GPT. Um, right, now when it comes to accuracy, this is like the most important thing. Um, I, like we, we have tried multiple questions. Uh, there's a blog post with more of them. Uh, it's kind of like a draw. Sometimes the keyword search gets lucky and finds the correct page. Some like, sometimes the vector search does, does better. So in the end, it was a draw, uh, we, uh, uh, which is, this is like just the, the most important. If there was a big difference here, uh, then we would have definitely picked one of, or another. Uh, the rest is convenience, for example. Uh, on one hand, with vector search, you have this extra work of splitting into paragraphs, computing embeddings, you need a model for that, or an API call, store them, do the search, and so on. Um, uh, but then, as, a, as, as we saw earlier, vector search doesn't require dictionaries, stemming, boosters, all this kind of stuff. You don't have to worry about it. Um, in our, I, I would call it a draw. In our case, it was quite convenient because we have all, the, all our docs. We have them in Zeta anyway, and we use the Zeta search as a search in our docs page. Uh, so for us, we kind of had that already, and we have vector search support as well. Uh, but it, there was this extra step with uh, uh, with computing embedding. So the result is a draw still. Um, uh, what kind of convinced us to keep using keyword search for now is really the tunability of it, uh, because with keyword search you do have all these controls. You know, it's on one hand bad because you have to use them. On the other hand, it's good because you have knobs to tune your, your relevancy. Uh, with vector search, there's just less of that at the moment. Uh, but of course, there's, there's, there's developments all the time, so it might, it might be better. And we found this um, really nice workflow of, uh, of uh, logging the questions that people have on our website. Uh, I can show you here. Um, so we have a uh, we have a log table um, that shows you know what questions people actually ask on our on our docs, and that's actually quite nice compared to you know when we only had search 
because in, in, if we were to log the search queries, people were searching keywords, of course, right? Well, here we actually can log the questions that people ask, and that gives us just a more intent of, you know, this is what they're trying to do. So we log that, um, and then what we do uh, is see which keywords ChatGPT generates, and we try that with our search engine, right? We just see what comes down. If the correct pages are found, usually the answer is correct. If the, if the correct pages are not there, then ChatGPT will usually hallucinate. So what we do is we try the keywords in search and see if the, if the correct pages are find, found. If not, we have three options. Uh, we might need to tune the search relevancy, which is nice because it also improves our search experience in the docs, not only the chat stuff. Or in many cases, we might need to add new docs or improve the docs because the question is valid, we just don't answer it with our current docs. Uh, or even we might need to add a feature that someone expected that it was there and we actually don't have, right? Uh, so we find this loop quite nice because it allows us to improve the docs and, uh, and uh, even the product. Um, uh, and it's something that we didn't before. We didn't have before this uh, chat assistant. There's also the bad part that sometimes it will hallucinate and users come to us and say, hey, your chatbot said this, it doesn't work, help me, <laughs> and then it's like, but so far, so far it didn't happen too often, it's fine. Um, uh, right, if you want to do something like this yourself, uh, you can actually use Zeta for it. We have this Zeta.io ChatGPT, it's this idea of ChatGPT on your data, uh, and we have a full example, uh, it's called Ask Your Stack, uh, it's, you know, it's like uh, open source, it has, a, it has a crawler, so you can say, I want you to crawl these uh, documentation pages, and then basically provide this UI around it. And you can, in this example, you can select which libraries and dependencies you have, and then ask a question. Basically the same thing that we have in our docs. So you can use that as an, as an example. Um, um, yep, and that, is, that was it from me. Thanks, everyone. Thank you very much, mm -hmm. Tudor. We have time for a couple of questions today. Hi, thanks. Uh, I think this is a great idea. Um, I actually would really like to do th this for our team as well. But mm -hmm. do you worry about sending your code to ChatGPT at all? Uh, in our case, the documentation is public, so it okay. doesn't, doesn't, doesn't really matter. Uh, otherwise, you know, OpenAI are saying that they won't train their models with the questions, with what you provide in the prompt. They won't, they won't train that. that. They said it explicitly. But of course, it's still a trust issue or maybe, you know, EU regulations might not allow you to do that. So, yeah, it's definitely... In our case, it's just public data, so... Well, thanks for the talk. Uh, I was intrigued by your prompt to extract the keywords from obviously mm -hmm. the questions. Have you tried more complex extraction chains because you couldn't also sort of uh, lemmatize the keywords? I mm -hmm. mean, obviously you had just yeah. two sentences, but I, you know, I tried a bit more and I was surprised that you can actually sort of replicate quite a lot more with ChatGPT. Yeah. Have you done that? or? No, I haven't tried that more, but yeah, it's, a, it's an area that would be worth trying different things. Uh, yeah, yeah. So far, the keywords usually make sense. I thought that makes sense when I on what I tried, so it didn't feel the need to tune that. Uh, uh, but yeah, it's definitely one of the places where 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 I would be curious to try some more stuff. Hey, um, hey. what do you do about the hallucinations? So you have a query and you know it's getting you back something wrong. How mm -hmm. how do you fix that? Um, so what I found is that if the answer is in the docs, then you don't get hallucinations or not that bad. When the answer is not in the docs, then it's really bad. Then you get really bad hallucinations. So then it's like this. Either you have to add the docs or tune the search to make sure it finds it and so on. So there's this process. If it finds the docs uh, but still hallucinate, I would still try to add more 
context, more words, and so on, to try to you know, give it more information to, for that particular question. Maybe put it even as a frequently asked question. Uh, so then it finds it and more or less just repeats it, right? Uh, it depends on how much time you have to, to play with this. Uh, but if you care about a really good experience, I think it's worth it to do this. Yeah. We definitely have time for one extra question. Oh, I see it. Uh, you mentioned uh, yeah. Hello, thanks for uh, for the presentation. You mentioned um, like DDoS attacks and uh, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Do you do something particularly with that, or yeah, we, how, we, how do you protect from that? Yeah, we we really just have a limit per month of questions per month, so which we don't expect to be hit. Uh, but if worst case someone starts to spam us with questions every second or something like this. It will hit that limit, and then you know our bad budget is fixed, and the feature is down from then on. But then we have the choice. You know, we can block that user, and unlock it, and such. Um, and as I said, with the with the GPT free turbo model, one cent per question, it's manageable. If we were to use GPT four with two dollars per question, then we would be really careful about it. Yeah. Okay, then I think we thank Tudor one more time with an applause. Thanks, everyone.